All right, let's get it. This is Nat Knows Buffalo, and uh, Manny, we just finished watching Thursday Night Football, yep. Thanksgiving, Buffalo yep. Bills Saints. Yes. And uh, the Bills, as it stands right now, before any games are played on Sunday, the Bills are back atop the AFC East. And it feels good. I know things have changed, but it feels yeah. real good right now. Yeah, I, have, yeah I, I feel great after that win. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So okay, so thirty-one to six. Yeah. Um, where where do you want to start? Let's just start with. I guess we'll start with Josh Allen, and then we'll go from yeah. there. Um, sure. I want to just put this out there now. I did put out a tweet that may have been overreacting a little bit. Um, I know I've talked about people who are overreacting on Twitter all the time, and you know what? I might I might have fallen victim of that myself. Um, Josh Allen definitely was. I mean, he was MVP Josh Allen in the second half. He was – there yeah. was moments where he looked shaky in the first half, but second half, like, just incredible the way he was able to turn everything around and the offense was able to turn everything around because they didn't end up having all of the results that we wanted in the first half. The second half, it was there, and it was there just on the back of Josh Allen. Yeah, I I thought – uh I thought your tweet was a little overreaction. <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit, little bit overreaction. Yeah, and you know how I feel about overreactions, but we'll we'll leave that that there. <laughs> but uh, you know, like Allen's, uh, I think there was kind of a miscommunication between him and what he thought Diggs was going to do on that play uh, on the first interception, second one. You know, uh, Cameron Jordan, he's a hell of a defensive end. He's been for years. He got his hand there, and and you know, like the the streak of no interceptions in the red zone was gonna end one day, and it did yeah. today. And I'm sure that bugged Allen a little bit because it's he it's knows sad to see that streak die. Yeah, but you know, it was gonna die one of these days. It was gonna last forever, and I I guarantee you, probably at halftime, Allen looked at that and probably said, you know. I should have I should have let it go a little bit sooner, and I, I I bet you that bugged him through halftime, and and honestly, Allen looked like a different uh, player. Like I didn't think he was that bad in the first half, other than those two picks. Like yeah, they they were a little miscommunication, but I thought he still was pretty good in the first half when he did throw the ball and his runs were great and. Um, so in the second half, like you said, it was it was MVP Allen. So yeah, uh, overall, I, so he was he was twenty three of twenty eight, two hundred and sixty yards, four touchdowns. Obviously, there was the two interceptions. Yeah. Um, anybody who follows me on Twitter, if you saw my <laughs> reaction after the second one, like I was very clearly not happy. We've had a string of games now where Allen has been shaky. I, I, I would I would put it, but he yeah. really recovered like really really well. And yeah, I mean, I, I you're probably right that he wasn't as he was not as bad in the first yeah. half. Um, as I think the I thought in my mind at the moment. Yeah, the two um, picks stood yeah. out. I think that's it, it why. People I think it was the timing or how it happened too, because yeah. Yeah. we were driving for the second yeah. one, and it was right before half, and it felt like yeah. that was a little deflating when it happened. Yeah, and then yeah. that first one, it wasn't like there was any issues with the offensive line, which is where I think a lot of us like to go when Allen throws an interception is, oh, well, he didn't have time. He was forced into this. It was just, I mean, you said it was probably a miscommunication, maybe a bad decision on Allen's part, maybe a bad decision on Diggs' part. But either way, like, it wasn't something that you could blame on the offensive line like we typically yeah. can. Yeah. So that's where my mind was like, oh, well, like, he's killed two of these drives now. But – Despite all of that, throw all of that out, throw any of that out, because MVP Josh Allen showed up the entire second half. Well, actually, you know what? Not the entire second half, because he didn't even have to play the entire second half. Yeah. That's how good he was. Yeah. Yeah, he was – honestly, I had no no issues. Those two interceptions, you know, it happens. <laughs> it's, it's funny what successful play can do to – like your thoughts about mistakes earlier in the yeah. game. Like if somebody yeah. makes a mistake and then yeah. they follow up with just being really good the rest of the way, you're like, Oh, like I'm, I'm not actually all that worried about it. And I'm not, I didn't, I didn't walk away from that game 
feeling the same way that I did when that second interception was thrown. Like, nowhere near that. Honestly, when he threw the second interception, I just kind of, like, said, you know what? They'll probably score in the second half. I wasn't yeah. really worried about it. I, I, I When I saw the replay, I was kind of questioning, like, what was he doing? I thought he, like, just badly threw it because he had Sanders open there. Mm-hmm. And when you looked at – when they showed the replay and you saw, like, clearly his hand – like uh, Cameron Jordan's hand hit Allen's pretty hard. You yeah. kind of knew that that was really, you know, he he probably kept it a second too too long. And um, that was that was where I was upset. Yeah. It wasn't because he yeah. got his hand hit. But let's not yeah. let's not focus on the interceptions, despite yeah. me yeah. being incorrect online the four about touchdowns. those in- interceptions. Yeah, the four touchdowns. And I, the thing that I love, it's not just that he threw four touchdowns. I love the distribution of the touchdowns because yeah. Dawson Knox getting two. Yeah. I like, I will, I'm a Dawson Knox fan forever. I've been a Dawson Knox fan or a Dawson Knox supporter. Um, yeah, you have. Been. And to see him getting the targets necessary to succeed. And then, I mean, like Josh can lean on Dawson Knox. It's pretty yeah. crazy as a Bills fan. I've never been able to say this as a Bills fan, but the Buffalo Bills quarterback can lean on their tight end when they need to make a play. I've yeah. never, I've literally never been able to say that as a Bills fan yeah. up until this year. And Dawson Knox has, and I don't know if it was going to t- to the tight end university that he went to with uh, Kittle and Olsen and all those guys, or if it's just like the time in the league to put it together or the time with Josh Allen. I don't know what has kind of think- made it click for him, but – Whatever it is, it's clicked for him this year, and the Bills finally have a tight end that they can rely on. I think it's a combination of all three. Uh, you know, you got to build that experience with the quarterback. Uh, I think you got to get that. You know, not everybody's going to have that rapport with Allen like Diggs did right away, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's part of it. I think it's also part of it being around guys like Kittle and Greg Olson. It, 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 you know, seeing how they play the game, how they warm up, how they practice, what they do, the little things, they can go a long way. It's no different than Alan going in the summer and learning, you know, fixing his mechanics, right, mm-hmm. to become a better passer. And uh, I think that's that's great that Knox, you know, he, he realized that he needed to work on something and he needed to go get some help on it. And he went there. And third, it you know, some players just click later yeah sometimes it is a slow burn to get the yeah, talent yeah. to where you want it to be yeah. so and I, yeah i mean it's all clicked for dawson knox this year though he yeah. is a he is a tight end one option like yes, just is. a true like you have to yeah. game plan for where he's going to be if you're the opposing defense yeah. option right now yeah i agree 100 percent. and then to go with some of the other target shares for the touchdowns we'll just stefan Diggs yeah. first they, they started off, I think they went to him twice in the first yeah. drive, and then it kind of first fell play. off for a little while. Yeah. First it was just goal. like right off the bat. It felt yeah. like, okay, this is going to be the Stefan Diggs game. It didn't end up being the Stefan Diggs game, but I'm okay with how it turned out. I would like to see a little bit more consistently of targeting him more often through I the think game. He had seven but catches. He had seven the, catches, was, nine targets. Like, that's yeah, nothing that's, to walk away from the game complaining about. Yeah, yeah. You can always look at, like, oh, well, we could just throw the ball to Stefan Diggs more. You can yeah. always, literally always say that. It doesn't matter if you throw to him 20 times. You can still be like, oh, but there was this play. So, despite there being, like, a couple of series where it seemed like he wasn't getting the ball, he still, I think it was seven catches, like, 74 yards and a yeah, touchdown. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm more than happy with that performance. I will be every single week if he if they duplicate that where, and it's I, I think it's less about the targets and more about the fact that they were able to complete a majority of the targets. Yeah, I think like also it was how Diggs did it. Um, his goal line touchdown, the way he just schooled Ooh. Lattimore uh, in and out, uh, just not just that one, but when. Uh, I think uh, one of the players, uh, cornerbacks, got hurt. Another one came in, and Diggs did that double double pump mm-hmm. fake and go. That's that's what Diggs does. And I, I put a tweet out, like, is Diggs the best route runner in the league? 
I think he's, he's I think he's top three in the league. I, that's what I was going to say. One. Yeah. I, I think there's like Devonte Adams. You could put him up there. Yeah. Justin Jefferson, who I know there's always going to be those comparisons. Justin yeah. Jefferson is a very good route runner. Yeah. Um, and I it's like he's he's up there with the best of them. Yeah. Stefan Diggs would be one of those guys I would list too. I like. I'm sure there's somebody. Keenan Allen is another guy who I would list. Yeah. Yeah. Top three, top five, wherever you want to put Stefan Diggs, he is in that elite level of yes. route running. And he proved that. Like those two plays right there, that's elite wide receiver route running. And he, he just proved why he's he's so important. And like you said, when he got that first catch, I was just like, the, he's going to do something where we're all going to be like, yeah, that's why he got Stefan Diggs. And and that that touchdown, you you kind of mentioned yeah. it already, but yeah. his touchdown yeah. catch, I don't remember yeah. who said it, and I, I do. I feel like I do this all the time. Like I see a tweet, and I remember the tweet, but I can't remember specifically who said it. So once again, I'm just going to throw it out there again. Sorry that I'm not giving yeah. official credit for who said this because I just can't remember. But somebody tweeted that it, like that route by Stefan Diggs was the type of route that you see a practice video of, and you're like, oh, that like that takes way too yeah. long to yeah. – actually develop in a game. There's no way you could run that in a game. But he did because he's just – and this was – Joe Marino actually tweeted this. Yeah. When it comes to goal line, when it comes to red zone, sometimes separation is better than size in terms of a receiver. Yeah. Yeah. It, like you can have a 6'4", six, 6'5", yeah. six, receiver, and if they can't get separation, it doesn't matter as much. Stefan Diggs is not this massive big body wide receiver, but he can create separation on anybody. And that's going to give him those advantages, just like we saw in that touchdown catch that Josh Allen can take advantage of. And that's why he's that go-to receiver. Yeah, I I have to give, and I know we're going to talk about it later, but I got to give a shout out to the O-line today because they gave Allen time for that play to develop. That play, yes. Yeah, and not just Allen, but also Diggs to complete that whole move. Because if if the O line couldn't stop those guys from coming to Allen, I don't think that would have happened. And so you got. I know we'll talk about them, but I got to give a little bit of credit to those guys for giving that play to develop a chance for that play to develop. Yeah, and I mean, look, if we're gonna if we're gonna trash the O line, which we will yeah. get to that, um, yeah. then we also have to still be willing to give them credit for things. Just like yeah. if we're going to praise Josh Allen, we yeah. have to be willing to still criticize him on things that are worthy of criticizing. Yeah. That play was a praiseworthy play for the offensive line because it was a slower developing route, and that was where Allen wanted to go with the ball. And if the O-line wasn't able to block for long enough, that play doesn't happen. And there's been plenty of examples of that happening throughout the season where yeah. the play, the, the the guy that we want to get the ball to, the play we want to run, it can't happen because the offensive line doesn't block. That that play, they did. They held their own on that play. And I, we need more of that. I, I know we yeah. can't get it all the time, but we need yeah. more of that and less right. of Deion Dawkins getting burned and then – holding the guy's jersey from behind, which yeah. this was not a good Deion Dawkins game. I, I don't no. wanna I don't want to encourage anybody to be like, oh Deion Dawkins, like let's yeah. cut him because we did see some of that this Honestly, week. Honestly there's a but lot like, of players he had a bad game. Yeah, he had a bad game. Uh and players have good players have bad games and and I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna kill on the O line just because I think they played a good game. It's one of the reasons why we scored four touchdowns and we ran the ball over a hundred yards, you know, like you got to give them credit today because they played well enough. I, I'm going to, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit here. I, you, you threw the well enough in there at the end and that, that changes the entire statement you just made to be much more agreeable. Yeah. But they like, they didn't play well. They weren't a good offensive line today. They weren't – it's not like they were giving Allen a clean pocket all the time. It's not like they were consistently think, opening up these massive holes for the running backs to run I through. I think there were some great – They held like, their own enough. Yeah. And that's why you said you said well enough, and that was – that saved it there from being a big argument. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I honestly <laughs> like that, that touchdown by Brita, and we'll probably go to Brita next. That touchdown mm-hmm. by Brita, that was Ike Botcher, the guy that we thought, like, you know, you got to give him credit for coming out there, taking out two guys, and giving a lane to Brita, even though Brita might have led him that way, but it's I... still understanding understanding where to be. <laughs> you know, half the times the 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 offensive line was behind the linebacker. Yeah. I mean, behind the running back, right? And so, like, I like, yeah, it wasn't the best, but it was good enough. And it was good and, enough today. And, yeah. And and for you know, until Brown and Feliciano come back, that's what we need. We need good enough. And I know that you know there's going to be. I'm sure people will be like Manny. You're just being easy on them. But I'm. I'm just. They've had bad games and <laughs> baby steps <laughs> for me. They've they've had bad games. This was. Yeah. I would say this was nowhere near their worst game that they've had. Yeah. It was one of Deion Dawkins' worst games on a personal yeah. level. Individually, yeah. He was he yeah. was individually that was a really yeah. bad game for yeah. him. But I thought, the thing I, that I I'm most confused with about the offensive line is how they – like, I don't, I don't know how you can have success as an offensive line when you're just constantly rotating parts and rotating parts and rotating parts. And I know it's partially because of how bad some of them have played uh, with it being like Cody Ford. Uh, well, Cody Ford Bates got sometimes. injured today, and, so that's why there yeah. was rotation. And then Bates got But, like, Cody too. Ford, Bates, Jamil Douglas, Botger, like, it feels like – that the guard positions have just constantly been rotating. Not that any of them are going to be really good by any stretch of the imagination, yeah. but if there if there's some level of consistency, if McDermott and oh, Bobby Johnson, if they can just pick somebody and roll with them instead of flip flopping back and forth, it's gonna like I feel like that would have been yeah. even more of a benefit, especially if they pick someone who's not named Cody Ford. I think the problem is like if you're talking about today's game uh cody ford got hurt then bates came in and bates got hurt and then douglas had to come in and so there was a rotation that way ike botcher was there he was yeah. there majority of the game but we so, have seen him rotated in and out yeah and i think what it's kind of like hockey when you and i'm going to take a hockey reference is when okay. your team's not playing good and you got, you know, you got your lines that are usually set. And then the coach starts, you know, as blending them, right? Like a blender. So you take, like, for example, like McDavid's not playing good. Dry Saddle's not playing good in Euler land. I'm using Euler land here. And all so of a sudden. That's really going to hit home with all the, with the Sabres fans that probably. <laughs> well, the Sabres don't have anybody <laughs> worthwhile to talk about. So that's why I'm going to use the Edmonton. So what they do is they put them together. So uh, what I think was what they were trying to do, they were trying to blend, use the blender and see if there's, there's one pair that can connect with the rest of the three guys that are permanently there. And I think, you know, they just couldn't find that connection within the offensive line. And now, you know, hopefully Feliciano and, and Brown are going to be back next week. And, and hopefully that you know the normal O line is back together again, which I think is is above the average O line. Um, so I, I hope so. Yeah. yeah, I mean they're much much better with Spencer Brown. I think there's no yeah. doubt about I that at this point. I honestly what, I guess what would be, with what's your Feliciano. what's your level of concern or I, I guess concern or um, totally blanking on the word I'm trying to go here. Confidence, concern or confidence with the offensive line going into next week's game with the expectation that at least one of Spencer Brown or Feliciano would be back. I think I'd be, I I think I, I wouldn't be like totally confident. Obviously I want the old line to be fully healthy and ready to go, but I think I would be more confident than today. Oh yeah, I mean yeah, for sure. Yeah. Definitely would be more confident than today. Yeah, so I, I I would say that you know if Feliciano or Spencer Brown came back, I'd be pretty confident that that should help the thing. Uh, I think Ike Botcher has been better out of the other like the four that have been rotating in. 
Mm -hmm. I've liked Ike better, especially this game. I thought he was a lot better. And so if Ike can play that, you know, as good as he did today and Feliciano and Brown come back, I think they have, they have a decent uh, chance to win any game. Uh, Obviously you want both of them in, but I, I'd take Ike Botcher out of, if I had to rank them, it'd be Botcher, probably Ford, and then probably Douglas. I like Douglas a little bit that he played, and uh, Bates is probably at the bottom for me. Okay. Um, all right, let's do Breda because we got to talk about Matt yeah. Breda. It's, I mean, this is something I was I – was, and here's another thing. Hand up, I was wrong. At the beginning yeah. of the season, I didn't think that Breda should be a large part of this offense. Because I, I just I, I thought that Singletary and Moss would be able to put it together with you know having that time in the offense, that time to learn, that time to get comfortable, and they just never did together. Like when when it was Moss, Motor and Moss, that combination just didn't, didn't really consistently work. Yeah. Um, and obviously Zach Moss at this point is kind of faded into the background a lot more than. You know, we I think we probably would have expected before the season. Yeah, the combination of Matt Breda and Devin Singletary for this game, especially, was probably the perfect combination that the Bills could have had at the running back position for for what they have available to them. You know, because like obviously you could say like, oh well, Jonathan Taylor would be yeah. a perfect running back yeah, combination. But, on his, like, we don't have Jonathan right, Taylor. <laughs> but so for what the Bills have. What Matt Breda and Devin Singletary gave them as a one-two punch, not just like with their skill set, but with how it seemed like the carries were distributed or just touches because obviously there's some receiving touches as well. It felt like that was just a much better game flow of them rotating than what we had seen with Motor and Moss. Yeah, I think uh, what Breda, like when I used to watch him in San Fran especially, he was a really good pass catching back, like one of mm-hmm. the I think top tier uh, pass catching backs, and he brings a different element. He's got a lot of speed, very underrated speed, and that speed to the outside where I think Motor and Moss kind of struggled. Brita Brita is quick. He gets to that outside sidelines like really quick, and it just was a different look. I think a lot of teams did not expect. Breed had to be that quick and, and kind of caught him off guard. And I loved how they used Breeda early to set the tone mm-hmm. of the run game. Uh, basically, they used right Breida away on that first drive. Yeah, first drive. Breeda and Allen set the tone for the run game, right? And mm-hmm. then second half, uh, uh, Singletary uh, kind of took over. Breeda was there to kind of play the third downs and and kind of came in to give him a break on some of those big runs that, you know, the 10 plus yards runs that he had Singletary, but I thought Singletary was great in the second half. And so I love that how they use Brita early to set the tone and then Singletary kind of took over in the second and set the tone there. But like when we're talking about Knox, that second touchdown Knox is because of the run game. Yeah. That play action worked because the because the Bills were running the ball successfully, even if it was four or five yards, because they were running successfully throughout to that point is what set up that play. And and that's what a run game does. And that's what Brita and I thought all three of them, Brita, Allen, and Singletary brought. They brought that thing that we've been missing, especially in the last uh, couple of games. And I, I I put out a thing that, you know, we've only lost one game this year where I think uh, Zach kind of went a little more detail from Buffalo Fanatics where I think we're 6-1 and one when we rush as a team for 100 yards plus mm-hmm. and we're 0-3 when we're not. And so it, it tells you that... That'd be 7-1 seven, seven now. Yeah, seven yeah one. now, now. Uh, so seven and one when you're you rush as a team for a hundred yards plus. So obviously the rush game is important. And, and yeah, I get it. We're a throwing team. That's never going to stop. But you're going to have more success at passing when you can run the ball. And and I think that you saw that today, especially on that Dawson Dogs touchdown. 
Here's the crazy thing about the running game, and I, I don't know. It, I don't know. Maybe it didn't feel like this to you when you were watching the game, but to me, it didn't. It felt like the numbers would look better than this at the like at the end of the game. Devin Singletary averaged two point nine yards per carry. Actually, both Singletary and Breda averaged yeah. two point nine yards per carry. I I didn't expect that because it felt like a majority of their runs were going for positive yardage and like four, five, six yards at a time, as opposed to just getting two or three yards. But I think it's probably because there's still obviously those offensive line issues where yeah, they're course. still getting hit in the backfield. There, so it's going to was- gonna take a couple knocks on their yards per carry average. Yeah, but yeah. they, I mean, Singletary ripped off a 15 yard run. Breda surprisingly didn't have a 10 plus yard run. His longest no. run was a nine yard run. But he still looked consistently good yes. doing it, and it, like he made a couple guys miss, and he, it seemed like he found the holes that Zach Moss wasn't finding. Yeah. So I, I'm very pleased with. Yeah. The, there's still improvements, obviously, within the running game. Obviously, but yes. the combination of motor and Breda. Yeah. It seems like that's the combination to to use yeah. moving forward because that's yeah. a combination yeah. that can be the most successful. Yeah, they they got that uh, ability to miss, get a tackle miss, mm-hmm. and then they're gone, right? That they have that burst, like burst out. Um, where I think that's one of the reasons why maybe the the average is down because they can also be the same guys where you know they don't get the miss and they lose three four yards, right? So it, it's like a hit miss, right, kind of thing where. They can get a 15 yard run and then the next play is a negative four yard run. Right? Yeah. There, there was one play that I kind of was like, I was kind of questioning Dable. I was like, or Allen, whoever, maybe Allen switched it, but it was like, uh, it had the tight end and the, and the fullback right in beside Allen and Brita behind, I think it was Brita. And he kind of like threw it to the side like a toss. Mm-hmm. But he kind of looked at the linebackers and then tossed it. And I was like, are you just giving the play away? And it was like a negative four or five yarder. So I think I think players. I know the exact play you're talking about. And yeah. I was kind of like he was looking at the at the players, like the newer it was like almost like leading him, here you guys go. Here's a free tackle for you guys. So I was kind of like there were plays like that in the run game where I think they can still process a little bit better. Um, but uh, overall, I thought they had a good run game. And whoever thinks that run game isn't important for your passing team to be successful, well, you just saw a game where the run game led to uh, the better passing game. Yeah, so I, I do have some gripes to get through with the offense before we move on to the defense because sure. I think there's obviously a whole hell of a lot to talk about the defense. Yeah, my, I think my biggest gripe with the offense right now um, is actually, and I don't like doing this, I actually think one of my biggest gripes is certain play calling. And it, it's not yeah. because I don't like just like the style of the play or the structure of the play or whatever. I don't like the situation of play calling sometimes. And it's, it's a specific situation. It's when the Bills run the ball on first and long or second and long. And it's, it's been first and 10, second and 10. There was yeah. multiple times. It was first and 20, second and 20 when they did this. Yeah. I, for the life of me, like, I don't think Brian Dable is a bad play caller. I really don't. Like, I think he actually dials up some really good play calls. And sometimes it's just the execution that doesn't work out. But this is something that I think has been an issue all season that when the bills Sometimes they want to try and find that consistency and they're trying to force that consistency. Yeah. And they end up killing their own drive by trying to run the ball too much too early, if that makes sense. Because like you said, the running game is very important. Yeah. But there's definitely a time and a place of how to go about doing it. And for some reason, those first and long, they love running the ball. I, and I, I just don't I can't wrap my mind around why. I, I think if I was thinking like a coach, I would think maybe they're expecting us to throw. And so that they, 
play a little bit back, which would leave a couple more holes open for the run game to get through and maybe get that, you know, seven, eight yards to make it a more manageable second down. But obviously, you know, so like you said, maybe the execution doesn't work. Maybe, you know, they saw that, you know, maybe it it was a you know disguised defense that that didn't make it work but i think as a coach that's what you would think right because as a as we all say we're a throwing team so teams expect us to throw more yeah i don't know i guess like and i i understand that but yeah. for in my i don't know the analytics all say when it's yeah. first and long second and long throw the you ball throw. doesn't matter what yeah because throwing the ball twice is going to be better than running the ball Twice, yeah. even See, and, and, completion. So for me, I, I will always question that. But then there's always going to be those moments where yeah. it does work out, like you're saying. And in that moment, I, I have to kind of like swallow my pride and be like, "No, it worked out this time. Don't be too upset." But then a majority of the time, I'll still be able to get upset. As a coach, I don't coach football, but I do coach hockey. And analytics is huge in every sport. So when they say, yeah, 75% of the time it works, I don't really think about the 75% that it works out. As a coach, I think about the 25% it doesn't work out and what that would lead me to have to do to in order to make the next player, make the next line change or anything like that. So... I don't know if that's how McDermott thinks, right? He doesn't think about the 75%. He thinks about the 25% that it could go very wrong. So, But, but and, yeah. And to, to quote, to have an anchorman quote, 60% of the time it works every time. Sure. <laughs> I mean, you give it a shot. Oh, 40% it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, I, 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 I understand where you're coming yeah. from. Yeah. That's just my – that's really my only gripe, yeah, like my I, actual I, I gripe. Because like I said, we, we talked about Allen already, and as soon as that success happens, as soon as he gets back on track like he did in the second half, all of that like even minute concern that somebody stupid like myself might have, it goes away. And like that, I think that was the first time all season where I actually let myself give in to the potential pressure or whatever of questioning – like is is Allen actually like is, is something is he okay out there like is he yeah. really questioning himself that was the first time I actually gave into that and as soon as as soon as he started having the typical success that we expect him to have yeah. all of that was just like whoosh, gone yeah. out of my mind if because we, like Josh Allen is one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL yeah even the best quarterbacks like you said they're going to have their mistakes even the best play callers they're going to have their mistakes but more often than not they're going to be doing the right thing and Brian Dable, good play caller. Some situations might not work out. Josh Allen, great quarterback. Sometimes he's going to make some mistakes. And we got to live with that. We can criticize him. We can move on. And we can celebrate all the good things that happened. Because when you're looking at this game as a whole, obviously there was a large majority of things that were on that positive side as opposed to the small things that probably stood out more or stand out more to, to people sometimes. It's easier to find those negatives sometimes. Yeah. But if you look at everything and like kind of it's add it all up, it's going to be much negatives. more positive if you're looking at that game against it's the Saints. It's always easier to find negatives than positives, no matter <laughs> what game you play. Um, the one thing I will say is uh, I got to give a slight shout out to Gabe Davis, who had another actually pretty decent game. He was involved again. Uh, two, did he have two catches? Yeah, two big catches. Important for, catches. Yeah, two yeah, important 40, catches. Yeah, 47 yards. So he was, uh, you know, he was catching balls. He was involved. And in, so maybe either he's getting healthy or he's just getting involved in the in the game more, but uh, I, I thought he had another really good game. Uh, but yeah, so they, that was the one guy I wanted to give a shout out to. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on special teams because I do oh, think that special teams, I, I got special teams. You got, okay. So then let me, let me get my special team stuff out of the way and then I will let you take it away. Cause I know where you're going to go with it. Um, <laughs> first and foremost, I actually want to give a shout out to, the kickoff coverage. I, I don't think we've talked about this enough. I don't know if this is something that is 
like really paid attention to a whole lot, but it feels like the Bills kickoff coverage is always there like before. Like the, the team is not if they return the ball, they're not getting to the twenty five yard line very often. So they're like the Bills kickoff coverage is more than doing their job and they deserve the like respect and they deserve credit for the field position battle that the Bills are more often than not winning against other teams, which is a, a big help in terms of winning a game. So the kickoff coverage, great. Tyler Bass, redemption game, great. Hit all of your kicks, field goals, extra points, awesome. Love to see that. And I will say Stevenson, because this is I know where we're going to turn it over to you. I am not upset by the way Stevenson played. I don't think he looked incredible. I don't think he looked bad. He looked like a rookie who – was playing in his first NFL game. There's some positives. There's some negatives. Luckily, he was able to recover his own muff punt, so he was able to not let that be a a legitimate issue that impacted the game. But you could see when he has the ball, he has that top-end speed, and he's got – he surprised me a couple times. I guess maybe one time. He seems like he might have a little bit of physicality to him that I, I didn't really expect because he took a, a couple hits and kept going on one of his punt returns that I just didn't expect him to keep going through. Obviously, he got wrecked on the first one. That was like a welcome to the NFL moment immediately. Yeah. But yeah. overall, like I don't think it's a big change at the moment from going from McKenzie to Stevenson. I do think there's a big long-term payout. But in the moment right now, I, I just I think it was like a – McKenzie's in the doghouse because of his fumble. I get that. I don't think we gained anything this week from bringing Stevenson on the active roster, but we didn't lose anything either. I I think it was a one-for-one trade-off where they stand at the moment. So I'm interested on your thoughts on this, though. Hey, I've been, since the start, I've been a McKenzie guy, and I'm still a McKenzie guy. I think, yeah, he lost that fumble, uh, and it probably got him in the doghouse. I don't know if it was an injury or he's in the doghouse. I I still don't know, but uh, whatever it is, I'm sure he'll get out of it. He's been a top uh, tier returner this year. His averages say so. No matter what people think, his averages have said that he's a top tier returner. And Stevenson, sure, it's his first game. So uh, I want to see something. You didn't show nothing. Bring McKenzie back. You, you are going to upset some people. I'm not. I, look, I'm not on the same. I'm not on the same. That's wavelength. fine. I. I you know what? On this. I have we a do. guy who's proven that. It, yeah, one bad fumble doesn't define him as a returner. So here's here's my thing with McKenzie. I want to bring him back into the game plan. I have no problem if they don't want him returning kicks anymore. I don't care about that. I want him involved in the Bills game plan because I do think I do think he's valuable on the in the offense. Yeah, I have no problem though because I do think Stevenson is the future of that role, the the Isaiah McKenzie role of a mix of this year and last year's role. I think Stevenson is the future of that. So I have no problem with getting him involved now since they did activate him. I, I don't see any reason why they would do anything other than keep him on the active roster moving forward because they risk losing him then. He play him. Play Stevenson and then use McKenzie in other ways. I don't know how they'll be able to go about doing that with the, the roster depth that they have right now, but they're going to have to figure something out because right now since they activated Stevenson, he's on the 53. Yeah. If they if they want to put him back on the practice squad, and correct me if I'm wrong here, if they want to put him back on the practice squad, they have to cut him first. And if they do that, he's probably going to get picked up. They I can't think, risk that now. I think he just be inactive. One of them will be inactive every game. I think either McKenzie will be playing and Stevenson will be inactive or Stevenson's playing and McKenzie's going to be inactive. And that, that's a possibility. I do hope they pick one of them and just I don't think they use will. that moving forward. I, I don't, I, I'm not going to be a big fan of flip-flopping. I think no. that's part, part of the reason that we talked about this already. The offensive line has had issues during the tenure of Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott because they've 
kind of continue doing that flip flopping at certain positions. It's I a, don't. I'm not a fan of doing that. I think uh, that's a a great way to if, cause inconsistency. If you're gonna pick one, I go with the guy who's already proven that he can return. And that's yeah. I mean, there, uh, I think the fan base is probably going to be pretty split on this one. Obviously, yeah. we know there's some people who are heavy, heavy on Marcus Stevenson. There's some people who are heavy, heavy on we need McKenzie back. Time will tell. I think long term, obviously, yeah, Stevenson long is the term, answer. If, if Stevenson, we'll can see prove, what the coaching staff thinks. If so. Stevenson can prove in the off season, sure, he can start as a returner next year. But right now, you know, if you look at McKenzie's stats. He's still in the top tier. Yeah, he had one bad fumble that resulted in that play, and he probably got sent a message about it. And I'm sure he understood the message. So we'll see. We'll see what it does. I think it'll be an interesting part uh, throughout the season. But how about Matt Hack? Like, I is just, that guy I, gonna? It's, is it's that guy gonna get a blocked it. punt? Like he is every time he's about to punt. I feel like he's going to get it blocked. It's it's just it's scary watching him. But look, the coaching staff is they are, they have invested in him long term, yeah. unfortunately, unless they want to kind of bite the bullet on the rest of his contract. He signed a 3-year deal. I don't know if there's outs in it or not. Yeah. That's something that I don't really like moving forward. I would yeah. love for the Bills to find another person to be the punter. <laughs> but at the same I don't know like what what is more valuable. Yeah. The your sanity of when he's punting or is it his value as a holder? Because I'll be honest, it's like, he hasn't been a good punter, but he's only, he's had the one block punt and then he hasn't had a block punt since. And I think that's what a lot of people talk about still. Yeah. He is a, he is a great holder for field goals and extra yeah. points. And they've talked about that. I think that's where his value comes from right now. Yeah. Yeah. I think the coaching staff cares more about that than, his it is scary, and that's scary. <laughs> it is so that's, scary. That is scary. Yeah, I, like there were like, I think there was one where he almost looked like he double pumped. It yeah, or, it was weird. It was so weird, and I was like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> I thought he was. I gonna... think that was. I think that was the one where Tariko said, "Like, I think he actually said that Mac Hat or Matt Hack." Um, he said something about how he like rushed his punt. When yeah. that happened, yeah. like no, he's never rushed a punt in his life. No, he looks he like punts he punts slow. Sweet ass time to punt. He does. Ball. He does. Yeah, he's gonna get hacked one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really hope that doesn't happen again because obviously that's a, a yeah. complete momentum yeah. changer. Um, all right, defense. Yeah, defense. Yeah. Um, do we want to start? A, let's. Do we want to start on a positive note for the defense, or do we want to just cover the negative and move on from there? I, I'm curious to hear what your negative is because I think I, my I, negative is very obvious. Everybody and their mother in Bills Mafia <laughs> has the same negative from the defense leaving that game, and it's I, I, Trey White yeah. and his injury. Yeah. With it being a non-contact injury, it's worrisome. Yeah. I don't know whether that's going to be ACL, MCL, PCL. I have no idea. This, that's all speculation. Who knows what it's going to be? Obviously, you hope it's not an ACL because then he's done for a while, done for the season. Yeah. But I, like, how do the Bills handle the cornerback position moving forward if he has to miss time? That's that's a big question mark, and I think that's where everybody's yeah. going to be like, "See, we told you, you need to address this position earlier." Because yeah, Levi Wallace is a good number two. I don't want him being my number one yeah. corner. Yeah. Dane Jackson is fine depth. I don't want him playing consistently. We don't have much behind the Trey you White think, you at think, that point. Once he goes down, it's a totally different room. You think EG, uh, EJ Gaines is uh, available to come up and play? I am, I am more than fine with not calling EJ Gaines. <laughs> he seems to always come back to Buffalo somehow. He does. He does. He does. <laughs> He definitely does. But, yeah, but yeah I mean, uh, Trey White's injury is yeah, it's, that's huge. it's worrisome. We're all going to be holding our breath collectively yeah. Yeah. to I find know. out. Hopefully, it's like, I don't know, a week or two weeks, and yeah. it's not really a bad injury. Yeah. Or, I, I mean, I'm I'm assuming it's going to be a couple weeks at the very least. Yeah. But hopefully, I it's hope not a serious injury. Yeah, like that's what I hope. I hope he can come back. 
uh, if it's even three weeks, kind of like the Knox, right? Put mm-hmm. them on short term IR or whatever you can. Um, so that it's a couple weeks. Dane Jackson, I think uh, it puts a lot of pressure on guys like Teron and, and Jordan Poyer and Micah Hyde to maybe help out a little bit more. Um, but, uh, you know, I believe in the secondary. If there's one group that I believe in on this defense, it's that secondary. They've been unbelievable this year. And I know Trey White's a huge loss. It's uh, so- For any team, it's a huge loss. But I think you're going to have to have some – Maybe some help with Tehran helping, and maybe some there's, safety they're help. Gonna figure some stuff out. Here's yeah. the, I guess, here's the only kind of saving grace with the the injury, and obviously, like nothing is gonna make it better unless it's Trey White's not actually injured, which it doesn't seem like that's the case at the moment. Hopefully, that is also an overreaction. He's fine. Yeah. The Bills play the Patriots for yeah. the, the following game, the next week, Monday Night Football. They don't have the greatest receiving core. Like it, the, I think no. the Bills defense can get by in terms of the passing game without Trey White yeah. for that game. Obviously, he benefits every single game, but they can get by that game if if they need to defensively. Yeah, and then there's a game where I don't think they can. I don't think no. they can get by defensively against the Bucks without Trey White. That's going to be difficult. The Panthers have good. They have good receivers. Yeah, DJ Moore is a great. But I don't know if their quarterback will be able. So like that's a that'll be interesting. Yeah. Then it goes back to the Patriots and then the Falcons, who they have yeah. Patterson, who's a receiver, running back, hybrid, whatever, tight end, quarterback. Yeah, yeah and they, but they have a tight end, <laughs> and then they don't really have like great receivers. Yeah. The Bills, luckily, the rest of the season there is only one game where it's like a glaring, glaring issue. To not have Trey White for the regular season, yeah, obviously, and like once having Trey White is one of the most important things that this defense can do. Just have Trey White, having him active, having him healthy. So it's a big blow to the defense to not have him healthy if he's going to be out for the rest of the season or even just a couple weeks, whatever the timetable is. But they can get by against the offenses they have to face outside of most likely Tampa Bay Tampa Bay because they aren't going up against these like world beater passing offenses. Yeah. So I'm conflicted here, not in terms of like, Oh, is this a good thing or bad thing? Very clearly it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing. No matter what. I'm conflicted though, because like my mind tells me the defense can't survive without Trey white. But then I look at everything and I'm like, no, the defense can, they yeah. can survive without Trey White if, if they need to for the, the rest of the regular season. There's going to be some ups and downs for sure. But this is – it's not a, a regular season ender, this season can't – nothing good can happen type of thing because they don't – like they, they don't play these great passing offenses the rest of the way outside of the Bucks. Yeah, and like you said, Carolina has some good receivers in Moore and Robbie Anderson and – I forget who else is there, but like like you said, the quarterback, we don't know what kind of day they'll have. But Tampa Bay is going to be tough, mm-hmm. like you said, and you're going to have it's to It's going to be tough a, with or without Trey White, yeah, too. That's yeah, 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 that's the thing. Yeah, you're totally right. Even with Trey White, that's going to be a tough game to play, right? But, um, yeah, you know, I hope the best for him. I hope it's nothing bad, but... Of course, yeah. If, if I'm not as worried. I'm uh, see. That's the thing is, I say all of that. I'm still worried for sure. I'm yeah, definitely still worried. Yeah, you still want your all pro, like, I, like your best cornerback there. But you know, if I didn't have guys like Teron and Hyde and Poyer around, I'd probably be worried. But I think, like, overall, the secondary makes me not as worried. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm right there. It's And that's why I said at the beginning of it's, this, like, I'm conflicted because, yeah. like, you know losing Trey White is it's a huge. really big deal. And it definitely changes when I'm looking at the Bills making a playoff run. Like, not, not just to get to the playoffs, but yeah. actually in the playoffs. It changes how I would think about every single game, for sure. Yeah. But getting there with the schedule the Bills have, it, it definitely hurts – it definitely hurts the Bills' chances of winning 
each and every game to not have one of your absolute best players. Yeah. But good defenses can survive injuries, even if it is a guy like Trey White. And I think, like you said, having guys like Jordan Poyer and Micah Hyde, who should be all pros, should be in the Pro Bowl every single year. Having guys like Levi Wallace, even, like I said, I know yeah. he, I don't want him to be the number one yeah. corner, but he knows how to play within this defense. And then having a guy who's playing as well as Teron Johnson is, I think they'll be able to figure out how to mask the loss of Trey White if they yeah. have to for enough games to get into the playoffs and give themselves a chance defensively and then kind of figure it out from there. But it's it's a big blow not having Trey White. So that's it's, the negative. It, that's I think that's the only negative I could take away from if, this game defensively. Though. If you look at the Saints, the Simeon interception, that that – was what I'm kind of thinking will kind of have to happen where Dane Jackson was covering the receiver and Poyer kind of helped out uh, Dane Cook. It was kind of like not really double Helped coverage, out Dane but Cook? We got a comedian out there? Sorry. Dane He's Jackson. just telling jokes out there, center of the field? <laughs> yeah, probably because you got me. And <laughs> That's then what it looked Poyer. like he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> he was telling a joke like Dane Cook. And then Jordan Poyer had to come over and save him by uh, by that interception. But I think that's the kind of coverage you might see going forward mm-hmm. is maybe that kind of a play where Dave Jackson, just because he's second year and like we talked about Knox, sometimes for players who've started off like first, second year, it just clicks later. And maybe, you know, it's early for him and, and Poyer needs to come in and help him out. Yeah, look, Dane ja- ever there was a ton of people last year and even this year who were tweeting Dane Jackson season. It's time to start Dane Jackson. Start him over Levi. We he don't even be. need Levi. Like yeah. all of these crazy things. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe they're not crazy. Maybe we'll find out that Dane Jackson yeah. can step up and fill that role. But it's going to be trial by fire. This is not a this is not a wait and see now with Dane Jackson. No. If Trey White is injured for the long term, Dane Jackson, step it up, dude, because if not if you lit, if you're a liability the entire way, You'll the way you kind of looked so far, like he, and I know, like he had to step in unprepared. If he if he doesn't step it up and you know kind of get it together with practice and then in the games, these then are the games we're for him. we're gonna know. Like yeah, no, yeah. Dane Jackson season was never really a thing. Yeah, so all these people who are tweeting that you're gonna find out real quick if calling for Dane Jackson to be a starter I, was actually the right move. I think this is the year a lot of players offense or defense where they're going to see who are the guys to keep and who are the guys to go. And I expect Bean to get replace those people. If Dane Jackson can't perform these next games, he's going to get replaced they're going to go out I, and get. I don't know how they can replace him though. Like that's that's. The, I don't think he gets replaced this season. Even if he struggles, I no, don't think they can. No, not this season. Not this. Okay, season, okay. But next season. So gotcha. what I'm saying is, from now till the end of the season, they're going to see these players like Dane Jackson, Isaiah McKenzie, the you know, the offensive lines like well, we already know what Cody Ford is, but Ike Butcher and all those guys. We're this is the time for them to perform and Bean's going to figure it out this summer that these are the guys where I need to replace and get some new bodies in here. So this is going to be a big uh, couple of weeks if Trey White's out for Dane Jackson. Yeah, look, he he has the chance to really solidify his spot on this roster and prove his worth moving forward. Yeah. So, look, I'm pulling for him. I obviously don't even want to see him play. I want to find out that Trey White's healthy. And yeah. all of this conversation we just had is a waste of time. <laughs> I hope that's what ends up happening. Yeah. But I'm not expecting that. So I'm pulling for Dane Jackson to step yeah. up and be – he doesn't even have to be a world beater. He doesn't have to be great. He doesn't have to be a superstar. Just be good enough. That's all you got to do. Yeah. So let's let's move on from that because obviously yeah. like that was – I think we talked about the injury and the effects of injury a lot more yeah. than I thought we would. But that's okay yeah. Yeah. because of how big of a, a potential loss it would be. I want to name a couple guys that I want to just give credit to on the defense, and there's three specifically that I want to end with. Um, so I don't want to take a whole lot of time, but I want to make sure I give some of these other guys credit. If, if there's one that I'm expecting that you're going to talk about, I'm probably expecting apology to after it, but we'll see. 
Mario Addison is one of them. <laughs> is that the one that you were talking about? Yeah. I'm I, not apologizing. I, I, I'm, I'm not apologizing <laughs> for anything. I'm not apologizing for anything with Mario Addison. He, I, I stand by everything that I have said about him previously, yeah. that he has made some really stupid plays. He did not look good last year. He, I still, even though he has been probably the most consistent pass rusher this year, uh, that that's not saying a whole lot with the Bills' pass rush that we've had. Yeah, but he he was the guy making the plays on the edge to start the the game. So Mario Addison stepped up and made some really big plays against the Saints. He deserves credit there. I'm not apologizing for criticizing him before though. Will not do that. There's times I will you will get an apology out of me, but Manny, <laughs> I this tried. is not I one tried. of them. <laughs> I tried Mario. I you tried. tried. <laughs> Look, I, Mario, if you're listening, um, keep it up. <laughs> uh, so he's one of them. F.A. Obata is another guy I think deserves yeah. a whole lot of praise because he's been a guy who's been you know on and off the active roster for game days. Yeah. But I really think that when he's on, when he's active for game days. The defensive line has looked better. I think he's a guy who just should be active moving forward the rest of the season. I don't really care about the like what the game plan is. I think he should be a guy who's worked into the game plan because he can do so many different things. And it's he's not a superstar. We know that. But he seems to make the right plays at the right time and be in a lot of the right spots. And no, he shouldn't be getting like 75 snaps a game. He shouldn't be getting no. however many would like 50% of snaps. Like he should still be getting snaps though. And he should be active because he makes plays. I really like what I see out of F.A. Obata. So he was another guy I wanted to mention. Uh, Matt Milano, obviously like we could talk for days and days about how good he is. He is, he, he's, he's the best linebacker on the Bills. I know Tremaine Edmonds is really good. I, I know he has much more athletic prowess. He has much more size, speed, whatever. But Matt Milano is I, – I think Matt Milano is still the best linebacker on the Bills. And he's just always in the right place at the right time, especially in the run game. I, I, and Edmonds has gotten a lot better, obviously. I think he's working his way and showing how important he is, especially when he's not out there. But Matt Milano just keeps flashing and making the right plays and – Especially on screen plays, yeah, he's he, really like he cool. comes downhill, makes the hit, and it like it's not like he crushes people. He doesn't have these like game changing hard hits, but he makes the tackle and he gets up, and then he goes and makes another tackle. Like that's just what Matt Milano does. Uh, I my three like if I had to pick some guys that I'd give a shout out to, um, uh, mine was Tremaine Edmonds was one of them. And okay. you, you could tell the difference he makes on that field. Like, mm-hmm. it's huge. And if you notice a lot, I I find that Tremaine Edmonds and Milano complement each other a lot. When Tremaine Edmonds is on the field, Milano, I think, feels like he has more rain to kind of fly. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, no, no, that's, that's a really good point. Yeah, like I find Milano plays better because he knows that Tremaine is there and he can do his thing. Because Tremaine, with his wingspan and his ability to run sideline to sideline, allows Milano to, you know, attack a lot quicker uh, in the run game. Also on those screen plays, like he he came out like flying on two of those where he just he saw the play developing and he just he just went to it. So mm-hmm. I, I find both of them complement each other a lot. And I think Milano struggled last week. And 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 part of it is because Milano's not there. And I remember when Milano was hurt, Edmund struggled a lot too when Milano was hurt. And so Yeah, I think I, that's I think that's a really good point that despite like them being really good, really athletic players, yeah, and they're good on their own. They, they, it's almost like they're good separate, but together they become this great duo that can do all. Yeah, lot because they, they, if you look at them, they have different uh, qualities of what they do good at, and I think what Tremaine Edmonds is good at, Milano's not as good at, and what Milano's good at, Tremaine's not as good at. But when you put them together, you got like this two-headed beast that's really good at everything, right? So I think, I think that's. Milano and Edmonds are very key, especially against the run defense, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think 
if we have them healthy, I think it'll go a long way uh, for the rest of the season. Um, yeah, and we know we know in McDermott's defense, obviously having those two linebackers is very very yes. key because we, yeah. like we've seen it his entire Keith, tenure in Buffalo is better Thomas when he has Davis. two of them. Even yeah, in Carolina, Keith Davis. Keith Davis were like, just like Milano and Edmonds, right? Yeah. So the the of, other so I did have, and I'm sure these three players were going to be mentioned, but I wanted to save them for last because yeah. I think they're just far and away the the best players on this defense right now. The way they're playing consistently these I'll just say these last like two or three games because one of them started a little up and down but he's really found his way the last couple games start there at Oliver just an absolute game record this is he's this is two Thanksgiving day games now that he has taken over and he doesn't show up on the stat sheet all that often but it feels like yeah he's noticeable he pops on tv and as a defensive lineman especially a defensive tackle I'm okay if you're not getting all of the stats, but you pop on TV. Yeah. You show up. Like if there's if they're handing the ball off and the running back has to make a quick jump cut right away yeah. because there's a Bills player who's in his way, it's probably Ed Oliver. Yeah. If the quarterback is getting pressure up the middle, it's probably Ed Oliver. Like he's he's always there. He's big enough, he's athletic enough, he's strong enough. It was unfair and- to compare him to Aaron Donald when he entered the league because nobody was ever going to do that. He's not that, but he is the type of game wrecker that the Bills defense needs. And he's really found his footing these last couple of weeks and seeing what he can do for the defensive line when he really gets going. And then especially when star comes back next week, I'm super excited to have that pairing when Ed Oliver is at his probably peak of what he's been in the NFL so far. That's what I was going to say. I'm like, he's doing this with Harrison Phillips besides yeah. <laughs> not Star. Like, it, when Star comes back, and we all know how important Star is to this D-line, uh, I don't think it's it's the same without Star being there. Um, but Ed Oliver really stepped up while Star was gone. And I think, you know, with Star coming back and a more confident Ed Oliver, like, I, I think, you know, like, I think that middle is going to be tough to get through. You know, um, uh, the other shout out I want to give out, like for myself, is Poyer and Hyde. Oh, that was the last two I wanted to talk yeah, about. We could talk yeah. about them every single week, no, we, but we need yeah. to start talking about them more. They, we should, we need to start a friggin' Poyer Hyde All Pro <laughs> Pro Bowl every friggin' year because they are yeah. the most underrated tandem in the league. No, because nobody so, actually talks about them. I, Josh remember, Allen right now is leading the AFC in quarterback votes. So we know Bill's Mafia's vote. Yeah, yeah. But somehow, Hoyer and Hyde, neither yeah. of them are leading for the AFC yeah, in safeties. Yeah. I don't expect both of them to be leading. No, They but, should both be getting those top votes. Yeah. But how is – like one of them should be up there with the safeties, yeah. and neither yeah. of them are. It's mind-boggling, Bills Mafia. We need to do better. Yes, we need what we need to do. We need to figure out some sort of like hashtag to get trending for Micah Hyde for All Pro because Jordan Poyer, like we could just hashtag All Pro Poe. That yeah. works. Yeah. What's Micah Hyde's? I don't know. We got to figure that out though because we got to get both of them trending and get that conversation going and, even more and, so, like outside and, of Buffalo. And Poyer is married to a celebrity, so he gets a lot of track record from that. <laughs> Micah Hyde, poor guy, has nothing. Like, nobody. <laughs> well, hold on now. Hold on now. That might be a little disrespectful. I'm no, sure Micah Hyde's got a lot of great stuff going on at home. No, like, no, not that stuff. <laughs> I, what I'm trying to say is, what I'm trying to say is, we need to help Micah Hyde. He's a quiet guy. He doesn't. He's he doesn't, a quieter guy. Yes. He, he doesn't. He doesn't much. have an outspoken wife to go on that. social media consistently. We we don't see his wife talking on social media consistently, propping him up. That, yeah. I think that's fair to say. Yeah, and that's what I meant. But like, no disrespect to her either. Like, no, no, she's, she's doing just that. not. She's just not the social media type yeah. to be like he, going out if, and about doing all of that. Yeah. And wives should be promoting their husband like that, you know. Like if they want to, yeah, you yeah, got to If they it. want to, you you promote your husband as much as you can. Um, 
Yeah, we need to find something for him though. Because yeah. Like we can roll with that hashtag all pro po. We got to find something for Micah Hyde because yeah. they both need to be trending every 100%, single week 100%. for how These bad guys, or for how sorry, not how bad, for how good they're playing they because like they are both all pro level players right now. Yeah. There's a reason that you don't ever see quarterbacks trying to throw the deep ball. No. Because it's, both of them are like it's pretty much just a hawks. brick wall back there. Yeah, they're yeah. ball hawks. You throw the ball against them, throw a deep ball against them, it's either getting picked or it's getting batted down Yeah, because they're back there, they're ready to go. You do not throw the ball against them. It just doesn't happen. Yeah, And there's a, like, there's a reason why both of them have as many interceptions as they do this year because they're so smart. They play so well together. They're able to disguise their coverages before the snap. And then after the snap, they're both – good enough to get wherever they need to be to make the right play. Like you very rarely see either of them being the reason a play gets made against this Bills defense. They both are just always in the right spot at the right time, making the right plays. And that's like, they create turnovers. They make sure that like, they don't miss all that many tackles. Like they're doing the right things. And they're the reason to bring it back to our previous conversation. They're the reason why, even if Trey white does end up, missing time, I'm still confident in this secondary yeah. Yeah. for the most part because yeah, they're so good that they can hold it down and make sure that they're in the right spot and that everybody else is in the right spot too. Yeah, they're rarely out of out of position. They they know what they need to do and they get it done. But like I I saw Pat McAfee show last week and Poyer was on there and he mm-hmm. talked about it that people talk about Ramsey and Adams and you know all but but nobody talks about us and we've been consistently you know like in interceptions top in the league in interceptions at pass deflections uh-huh. at uh, you know p- player passing rating you know against them and it, the list goes on and on so yeah we 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 need to get these both guys in the Pro Bowl this year they they deserve it they deserved it last year. And they deserve it this year. And they will deserve it next year and the year after that. Yeah. And however yeah. long they decide that they want to play for Buffalo together, they're both yeah. going to deserve it because they're that good and they've good. played that well. Yeah. They Honestly, they deserve they deserve to just retroactively be given their Pro Bowl yeah. votes like for previous years for how they yeah. played before too. Yeah. So, yeah, I, the endless, endless amount of praise for the, Ed Oliver, they're... for Jordan Poyer, for Micah Hyde, for those guys because – they have just been so good for this defense. This They're year. the and I believe the the past regime is the one that brought Poyer and Hyde to Buffalo. I think I think it was I don't see this. I always I'm never sure about this. Yeah, because I've I never it sure. was it was it was before Bean got there, but it was after McDermott. Whaley was fired. Yeah. It was when McDermott was the coach. So McDermott was definitely a part of it. Yeah. I never know how much Doug Whaley was actually a factor in all of those decisions or how much that was more, hey, Sean, here's your team. Go ahead and make the changes you want, and then we'll let Doug Whaley deal with the actual financial side of things. That's I have no idea, but all I know is I'm super thankful. You know what? This is great. We have to give thanks because it's Thanksgiving. Well, in, let's, in, let's, in, who, who are we thankful for? Do you want to just run off the list of the entire Bills defense right now? Like That's who I'm thankful for. Thankful for Josh Allen. I'm thankful for Stefan Diggs. I'm thankful for Matt Breda recently. And I'm thankful for every single, almost every single player that lines up on the Bills you know, defense, except for maybe somebody with the initials VP. You know what I'm thankful for? I'm hmm. thankful for that that the Americans have Thanksgiving in <laughs> November so I can wa- take a day off from work here in Canada and watch football all day long. It is that's, a, that's a good thing. That's a good thing to be thankful for. Yeah. The second thing I'm thankful for is you and Casey for getting me here with Nat Nose Buffalo. That's I got to say I'm thankful to both of you. And the third I'll say I'm thankful for is I'm thankful for Josh Allen being our quarterback because yeah. I don't know how many years I I looked at other quarterbacks and I'm like I wish he was in Buffalo. <laughs> We don't, have to, so do that we don't have to do that yeah. anymore. Yeah. We yeah. got our own two hundred fifty billion dollar guy. Mm-hmm. And look, we are we are definitely. I think that 
it's been such a weird season with the Bills. Like, there's yeah. definitely been some downfalls that we haven't expected, yeah, I and we're whatever. The, we're the this hunting. team, though, not is the... on. I think they're on the right track with getting some of those guys back and yeah. getting this win on a national stage. But they need to make sure that the mentality that they went into this week with, they go into every other week with, because if they don't, then I think that's when they get caught kind of sleeping a little bit. And you can't get caught sleeping on opponents when you're supposed to be a favorite. There's a reason that New England, despite not always having the right talent, they've they've always kind of had that mentality of, yeah. oh, we're being disrespected. you got to find that somehow. I know we don't want to be New England. you got to get that emotion. But we got to find something about, yeah. like, oh, they're disrespecting us. We can't take them lightly. They have this really good player. They got to you got to find something about the other team, something about that week, whatever, and use that as your motivation because like you said, when you're the hunted, yeah. you can't take anyone like it doesn't work. When you do the, that, that's when the Jacksonville game happens and that's yeah. when the Indy game happens yeah. and that's when with the Gosh. Pittsburgh week 1 game happens. Like that's how that stuff happens when you go into games kind of taking things lightly because you're like, "Oh, we're all we're this great team." You can't you can't do that. I think the Bills, whatever mentality they had going to this game against the Saints, they got to keep that rolling and keep that motivation going the rest of the season. Yeah, last year we were the hunter, and this year we're the hunted. And mm-hmm. So it's a different mindset. And you're right; like they got to keep this New Orleans game mindset the rest of the way. That yeah, we can't take no team lightly. Right there with you. All right, let's let's finish off with the bets because we got to do this. Yeah, we are we are getting through the season. Uh, I'm consistent. Uh, really poorly. Yeah, you're consistent. We're <laughs> we look. I, I I think we have to we have to say this again because we've said it in previous shows, but we got to say it again. We've never claimed to be incredible gamblers. Like no. we just have fun doing this. Yeah. So. You're probably better off fading our picks, and that's fine by me. Yeah, if you can Casey, make money Casey's, off of fading our picks, Casey's yeah, Casey's been, been good. Yeah. Casey's been, Casey will also claim to be a great gambler. Yes, and I think he's just on a, a hot streak that he hasn't ever been on before, personally. <laughs> and I can say that because he's not here to defend himself. So whatever. Um, but yeah, so five best bets of the week. Manny, you went two and three last week. You are an abysmal <laughs> eleven and twenty-four since week five. That's just incredible. Oh my goodness, that's so bad. Um, I am I am better, but not much better because I went two and three last week, and I'm fourteen and twenty-one since week five. That is honestly, this has I'm probably like been my worst back. stretch. Of gambling. I'm not even gonna lie; it's my worst stretch of gambling. Um, but I'm still like my at my best. I'm like. Five I'm what, so, two and a half games behind you, three behind games behind me, you? yeah, but we're both a lot behind Casey because Casey went three and two last week, and he is the only one who has been winning his bets consistently. Casey is 20 and 15 since week five. I will read off Casey's bets, and then we'll go through ours. And I am still considering what strategy I want to use this week. I have one in the back of my mind that I might have you go first on. Okay. But here's, here's what Casey's are. Casey has Eagles minus three and a half against the Giants. Colts plus three against the Bucks, Falcons minus two against the Jaguars. He's got the Panthers minus two against the Dolphins and the Chargers minus two and a half against the Broncos. So those are Casey's. Manny, do you want me to give my bets first or do you want you to give your bets first? I'll go first. Because all right, like all right, there's every, your confidence. Casey, you know, he says that I try to copy his picks or your picks, but – I made sure that this time I don't know how it worked out, but I completely have different picks than than Casey okay. this week. So I got Houston minus two and a half against Miami. Okay, I got Houston. Uh, I got Cincy. Wait. Houston isn't Houston playing the the Jets? Oh yeah, sorry, the Jets. I'm okay. reading this wrong. Uh, right. Houston, just... yeah, Houston uh, minus two and a half against the Jets. I got Cincy minus four against Pitt. I think Pitt struggling there. I got Mini plus three versus San Fran. Okay. I got Seattle uh, plus one and a half of versus Washington. And then I got Rams and Packers over 47. 
All right. You went with the, the over there. You haven't taken many overs this, no, no. this year. No, no. Okay. So here's, here's the thing is going into this, I was considering, do I let Manny go first and just take the opposite of his picks? <laughs> and I don't even have to because you did that for me. Yeah, on three really? of them. Yeah, Holy we are going God. against each other on three picks. Okay. I, I will say I started off with I have the Titans covering five and a half yeah. um, against the Patriots. It's not because I think the Titans are actually a better team. I think the Titans are probably going to start falling off a little bit. However, the Titans, I, I just heard this um, this past week. The Titans, in their last, I, I think it's, I think they're 14 and 13 in their yeah. last 27 games of the underdog winning outright. Oh, no, really? So not them, but just the underdog in their game. Oh, wow. And it's even better of just looking at them as an underdog covering spreads. So I don't think they're gonna. I don't think they're gonna end up beating New England. I do think New England gets the win. I think, unfortunately, they do. I went back and forth on if I would pick New England to cover. I think. I think Tennessee's gonna be able to keep it close, and they'll be able to cover, but they're probably not gonna win. You got about so five and got, a half. That's why. Yeah, that's why I had originally. It's, they're yeah, at seven know, and a half, half now. Well, then I'm going to change that, and I'm going to take it at 7.5 because I haven't yep. placed that back yet. So Titans yeah. 7.5, that's even better. Love yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I was surprised. Falcons, I did, I did end up – I'm locked in on the rest of mine. That was the only one because I've been going back, on, back and yeah. forth on it all week. I just didn't update my numbers for that. I'm locked in on the rest of them. I got the Falcons minus one against the Jaguars. So that's the other one that we're not against each other on. But then we're against each other on the rest of them. I got the Steelers covering three and a half against the Bengals. I got the 49ers covering three against the Vikings. And I got the Jets covering three against Houston. So we are just directly going against each other on these. Yeah. Lines. Yeah. It should be interesting. Mini, Mini has surprised me. They've been in a lot of close games this year. And uh, even last week and the week before, they, they, they've lost some heartbreakers. They've won some close ones. Yeah. So. Here, so here's what I will say. I think I don't think the Texans can win two games in a row. I, I think know, whatever happened last week against the Titans, they kind of caught that semi magic because it was still ugly. I don't think they can win two games in a row. So that's all I'm betting on with them. I actually almost took the Jets to just win outright. Couldn't yeah. do it. I love the 49ers in their game because because. They're just so much better when Jimmy G plays versus anything yeah, else this 100%. year. They have been a really good team when Jimmy G plays. I think the way he runs their offense, it's just – it's consistent. He gets everybody involved. They found a perfect role for Tebow Samuel. They're getting Kittle involved now. Like, that offense is rolling. No and I, I know Minnesota is good. I know they just beat the Packers. I think this is also a perfect letdown spot for them. So that's yeah. where that's why even, I'm rolling with these. Even if they're a letdown spot, they have been like within like three, four points every game, majority of their games. They have, but that's and, why it's only a. Th- if this was a five point spread, yeah. I feel differently. But it, with it being a three, three point spread for me, that's why I got it at. I'm yeah. I'm comfortable with that because I do think yes, Minnesota's played close games. But I just, I'm trusting, I don't like doing it, but I'm trusting in Jimmy G. I'm going with Kirk Cousins. All right. Kirk Cousins, met him. Nice guy. Nice guy. You actually did meet him? Yeah, no, I I actually did meet him. I've never, I haven't been, when I've said that before, I wasn't lying about that. I've actually met him. I didn't hang out with him, like, by myself for the entire day, but I was at a camp coaching, and he knew the guy who runs the camp. Oh, so cool. he came by for a day and he kind of talked to the kids at the camp and hung out with people, told his story, and then was just kind of there at the camp for the day. So when he was coming around, I got to talk to him for a little bit. Very nice guy. Yeah. Very nice guy. Um, decent quarterback. Decent quarterback, yeah. 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 Definitely decent quarterback. Made a ton of money for himself. So good for him. Very okay. rich. Terrible, terrible decisions when he's grilling food, though. Like, have you ever seen that? No, I haven't. No, he yeah he he puts his he puts like whatever meat he's grilling in tin foil boats. It's oh. it's weird. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, no, don't trust no, him no. on the grill. But <laughs> trust really nice guy, him. good quarterback, not great. Yeah, 
hundred percent. Yeah, I guess that's that's a good way to end the show right yeah. there. Next week, we obviously like we didn't cover some of the typical stuff that we do. Next week, we'll get back into that. We don't have to do a recap, so we can just jump right into everything else. Um, so we'll be back on the regular schedule next week, and we'll talk about the Patriots game and everything. But big win for the Bills against the Saints. Yep. Man, let me get a go, Bills. Go Bills. Go Bills. Go Bills.